joined by my guest, Brian Berletic in Bangkok. He is a geopolitical analyst and a former U.S. Marine. In Lisbon, we have Alexander Guerrero. He is an international law analyst. And here in Moscow, we have Sonia Van Den Enden. She is an independent journalist. All right, cross-stack rules, in effect, that means you can jump anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Let me go to first uh, to Brian. Brian, we have talked many times uh, uh, about U uh, Ukraine, this conflict, and more or less, I think you and I have been in agreement, and I think you, we, the trajectory that we saw for this conflict is playing out because we're seeing the the uh, the 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 room for maneuver narrowing very very much. We, we've had this. Uh, a budget issue in the United States, which has divided the Republican Party, and soon will uh, divide the entire Western world. The good, interesting thing about the, uh, the budget crisis in the United States and the election in Slovakia, um, which is the, the, the winner there is questioning the entire Ukraine project, the important thing that's happened just recently is that you can talk about what is wrong with this policy. Debate is beginning to happen. 20 months in, but now you can actually, in polite society, debate this. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I, I think it's the veneer falling off of this entire project, just like every other U.S. war of aggression or proxy war. It's always accompanied by huge amounts of propaganda, and that propaganda can only sustain itself for so long before the realities on the ground start to break through. People start to wake up to it. And when people begin waking up to it, uh, they cannot go back to sleep. Uh, to these lies. And we have, I mean, we have talked about the short supply of weapons and ammunition and how this proxy war was unsustainable, how Russia is ramping up its own military industrial production. Uh, all of this has made this unsustainable. The lies are not working anymore, and there's nowhere else to, to hide what is really happening. So now they have to confront it, and that's where things become very ugly. You know, Alexandra, our guest in Lisbon, uh, I've been watching the, the different narratives um, from the beginning. Um, democracy versus autocracy, um, Ukrainian sovereignty, um, uh, this is all about China. You know, they keep changing um, their, their rhetoric. But the most recent one in the last few days is, we need a pragmatic solution. I don't know what that means, but there, there was a pragmatic approach to this before the conflict started, and it was addressing the wrongs of the Minsk process, and Russia presented its own blueprint, and it was ignored. That was pragmatic. Go ahead, Alexander. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, actually, the European Union, even this week, it took, uh, are taking and are taking increasingly bold steps because they feel that the bet is going wrong and support is beginning to fail due to the exhaustion and lack of capacity to beat Russia due to fatigue. That's why they wanted to get together in Kiev, and even the speeches used are absolutely bold and disconnected from reality. There is a widespread perception that people are beginning to, to, to realize that winter is coming. And this is a clear sign that the West is far from the right side of the story, because the dominant discourse continues to be characterized more by the anti-Russian message, by the Russophobia, rather than peace. For example, talk, speaking about a European Union from Lisbon to Lugansk is just another desperate attempt to create a catchy message that will resonate with recipients and give them encouragement and confidence. They took advantage of Charles, Charles de Gaulle's message of a European economic area from Lisbon to the Urals or Dmitry Medvedev's message of Lisbon to Vladivostok, constructive speeches that favor an area of peace and friendship, and suddenly we see the European Union making a speech demanding Russian lands they no longer even discuss that Lugansk is Ukrainian. They want this to be a space controlled by the EU. And in the end, what I see only is that Borrell, what he described as being a garden like Europe, now is getting closer and closer of becoming the jungle. Yeah, well, Sonia, this whole statement about Lisbon to Lugansk, that was um, Annalena Baerbach, and uh, I just don't think she knows very much about geography, so I think it's more stupidity than a policy aim. But, but Sonia, one of the most important things that's happened, we had the Slovakian election, and we had the electorate there reject the EU's policy, NATO's policy when it comes to Ukraine. 
probably joining um, Hungary. There's a lot of rumblings in Poland, but that could be for different reasons because of the upcoming election here. But you can't talk about European unity anymore. I don't believe it was ever there because nobody ever voted on it. Sonia. No, that's right. And also, uh, yesterday there was a huge demonstration in uh, the day before, somehow last week, Unification Day, the 3rd of October, that is. There was a huge demonstration in Berlin because of unification of Germany in 1991. But uh, after that, because they said around 30,000 plus people came, uh, now today it was known that uh, Scholz is not going to send Taurus rockets to, uh, to Ukraine. So maybe they uh, get a little bit frightened as well. And as you mentioned, yeah, this Baerbock type, she is so dumb. She even thinks there are 565 days in the year, I think. So, but I think the unification in Europe is it's it's gone. And uh, recently there was also an interview with an Ukrainian uh, MP, and she said on Sky News that okay, everything went according plan, but. Uh, they only uh, gained 1% of land in the counter-offensive. And she also thought that uh, the weapons from Europe, the flow now is, is stopped somehow. So they might postpone the whole counter-offensive until uh, spring next year. So, <laughs> I mean, this is clearly a sign. And there are more signs in uh, the European Union that with coming winter, the people will rise up more, as we can see in, um, in Germany now. Even MPs in Germany are targeted. They are uh, the one is in hospital, and the other one, Alice Weidel, she I think she went to Mallorca or something. But there's a lot of things going on, and the unification for Ukraine, I think it's slowly but surely it's gone, and it was never there. Only the Western part. It, it was never there. So well put here. You know, Brian, we had um, Zelensky, and he, he does mostly PR work. I don't know what it, else it means to be president of, of Ukraine. But he, I think it was Italian media. He, he said uh, um, he admits that, quote, there is fatigue. And of course, he's looking at the money trough and the spigot from the, from the West, which is in question. I, I don't think, you know, that that's over yet. I think there's the, the, the differences in the United States and the U.S. Congress will be resolved one way or another. And th there will be more appropriations, May, probably not as much, but they will continue because the, the, the Democrats can't admit defeat on this. They want this war to continue. That's it. They're not, they don't want peace. They've never wanted peace, and, and they've only wanted a, a damaged Russia, which they're not getting. So they're just going to continue what they're doing. Brian. And unfortunately, only a small handful of people in the U.S. Congress actually do want peace. A lot of people who are opposed to Project Ukraine are only opposed to it because it's not working out anymore. Uh, its prospects look very dim, and they want to pivot toward China and then repeat this whole process with a nation with an even larger population, a larger military, a larger industrial base, and they want to start the process all over again. Uh, I think the money issue will be resolved, just as you say. I think the, the West is going to run out of arms and ammunition that they can send, in, at least in sufficient amounts, to Ukraine long before they run out of money. The U.S. prints money out of thin air, although this whole proxy war and the sanctions that accompanied it uh, targeting Russia, this has put in danger the, the unipolar system, all of its financial mechanisms. It has uh, served as a catalyst to spring multipolarism forward and help put uh, another foot in the grave for unipolarism. Yeah, Alexander, that, that's, I, get, I guess one of the most mystifying things for me during this entire process is the position of Europe. I mean, all, all it does is damage Europe's um, economy, its prospects, um, and and it's standing in the world, and I don't see it recovering. I mean, we have, on this program, I refer to him as Sergeant Schultz. When he addressed the United Nations, nobody listened to him. Nobody wants to hear what the Europeans have to say in the Global South. Alexander. And that's, and that's currently the situation even in the European Union. For example, if we take Germany as, a, as an example, an entire branch of the German economy, the chemical industry, which provides jobs to more than half a million people, is on the verge of collapse. This is just one clear sign of what's happening to Europe. No one believes anymore on the European Union's leadership and European Union member states' leaders. Why? Because you, don't have, you have no longer 
people like Charles de Gaulle, like uh, uh, other politicians from the from the 60s and from the 70s, real leaders. You don't even have a new Margaret Thatcher. What you have only presently is wannabes, people who want to be uh, to create inspiration on the Europeans, but they but they lack the knowledge, they lack the charisma, and they know nothing about strategy. And that's why people are now showing signs of saturation. Polls reveal a growing weakening of European support for Ukraine, and now we are beginning to see cracks opening up in the long for unity. In the last few days, for example, we have seen a political change in Slovakia. That political change was strongly influenced by the situation in Ukraine. Even the situation in the United States, when I read the declarations by the Republican uh, House uh, group from the House uh, against House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, he was overthrown. And one of the reasons expressly mentioned was the insistent support for Ukraine. Now we will see what happens on Sunday in Poland. But truth is, a little across Europe, we are beginning to see parties without much expression appearing as part of the solution. And they emerge as a possible solution because people are increasingly fed up with the debt and into which they have been pushed to. And this is the, presently the, 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 the situation, for example, that even the financial situation in the West, to a large extent, is influenced right, by the agenda. I, 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 I'm sorry, I have, I have to jump in here. We have to go to a hard break. And after that hard break, we'll continue our discussion on Kiev's dilemma. Let's go back to Sonia here in Moscow. Uh, over the last couple of days, I've come across some very interesting, fresh demographic um, 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 research into, uh, into uh, Ukraine. And by some estimates, not by all, but by some estimates, Ukraine's um, a population is half it was in 1991. And it is getting smaller. It, is reach, it could reach the point of 20 million people. It had 50 million in 1991. So this is all what Western help is doing for Ukraine. It's creating, it ha, Ukraine is experiencing the, the, uh, a, de, a demographic catastrophe unlike anywhere else in the world. Sonia here in Moscow. Yes, of course, uh, the half of the population, a bit lesser than the half is gone to uh, Europe, you know, they fled. Uh, I think about 4 million are now in Russia itself. I mean, like uh, the regions, Moscow and so on. But I mean, the, 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 there are so many, also so many people die, so many soldiers. We see all the, you know, the on Telegram, you can see it's clearly that uh, Ukraine is losing badly on the battlefield. So that's also a big part. So yeah, maybe this is actually what they want. They want to empty a little bit Ukraine. And uh, we heard already some rumors or rumors, maybe it's true or not. I cannot verify it myself. but. They want to uh, have the land in Ukraine because, you know, it's very fertile land. So uh, the grain comes from there. We all know that. Of course, it's mainly from eastern part of uh, what is now Russia, so the Donbas. But uh, it, it's very sad to see that all these people are gone. And I mean, the majority, I think, will not go back to, to right. Ukraine or to parts of Russia at all. They, they, they will stay in Europe. So. This is maybe the whole uh, idea because, you know, Poland has some aspirations for the western parts of Ukraine. That will be Poland, they said. They're already busy with that. So I think Ukraine will not exist anymore in maybe uh, a few years or maybe sooner. We don't know. Well, Brian, that, you know, this is something you and I have talked about from the very beginning. I, I think after everything is said and done, there will be some country called Ukraine but it's certainly not going to be what it was in 1991, 2014, or uh, 2023. Brian. Absolutely. And I think this continues with the theme of uh, who is the, the, the biggest victim here and who is creating and driving all of this. From 2014 onward, the U.S. reshaped Ukraine into a battering ram to be used against Russia. It provoked this war deliberately. Their think tank documents talk about deliberately provoking Russia to extend it, overextend it. And now we see these terrible consequences playing out in Ukraine for the Ukrainian people. We also see the European economy 
uh, taking a hit because of this, the, the sanctions, and then the United States itself uh, essentially isolating itself on the global stage and uh, sabotaging uh, all of these advantages that it held economically, financially uh, for decades. Uh, all of this uh, tells us who is who is the real threat to the collective West. It is the United States and its foreign policy. It is not Russia, and it is not China beyond that. And uh, as far as the fate of Ukraine, it, it's still very hard to tell. I think there there could be some remnant uh, remains of what used to be Ukraine, uh, but I think Russia is going to continue pushing. They they obviously have the advantage. They have no reason to stop. The West has not given them a reason to stop. Uh, so it, right now, I think it's still hard to tell, but what will remain is, is going to be, be very small. Well, Alexander, whatever does remain after everything is said and done, it will be demilitarized. Let me repeat that. It will be demilitarized, okay? Russia is not going to allow NATO to, uh, uh, to do you know, the Ukraine Project 2.0. They will not allow it. Alexander, also, Stoltenberg uh, last week, he let the cat out of the bag. It was all about NATO expansion. I mean, it's really quite incredible, you know. Uh, somebody has on the internet a montage of three minutes, so, you know, it's not about NATO, it's not about NATO. And then, well, of course, it's all about NATO. So at least, the, the, you know, they've drawn the curtain back on that. It, it's all about destroying Russia, okay? But is that what people really want, okay? I don't think so. No, actually, what I hear and what I read here and there is not the same as what the leadership of Europe, Euro, European Union and NATO actually are trying to spread. They are trying to inspire people in order to hate Russia and that the most important thing is not to bring Ukraine up to the level, to the same level or, and quality of life that the European Union had to be. But the main goal here is to finally defeat Russia, be able to defeat Russia, and then get the Western influence in Russia. This is the major message that, that they want to share. But in the end, what I would like to highlight is the fact that what, what you said, Peter, it's the militarization, not only of Ukraine, but presently Russia is demilitarizing NATO itself because NATO countries are also losing their ability and their capacity even to protect and to defend themselves from a foreign threat. Even days ago, there was on the news something saying that the, even the Israelis had to help Germany to keep their air defense systems up and operational in order to allow that in case of emergency, they would have the means to protect themselves. So this is one of the most important lessons that we get from here is the militarization from NATO itself and losing the whole war of the conflict that they are presently waging and trying to wage against Russia. However, there is a good point here from the Russian side also, which is that Vladimir Putin and all the Kremlin, they are not going after the provocations that they are receiving from the Western side, because the West wants Russia to lose their minds and finally to get bold on this conflict. And they are quite moderately and patiently waiting for the European Union and NATO to demilitarize itself. Yeah, I think, you know, that's, it's, it's been a huge question all during the conflict. What was uh, the, um, uh, the plan, the Russian plan? Because, you know, historically they think of the Red Army as a steamroller going across Europe. Well, that has not happened, and it's a very different conflict than one would have expected. Sonia, you know, this militarization of Europe, I find it really interesting. First of all, I don't think voters want to pay for it, and I certainly don't think young men want to join up and fight Russia. I just don't see it. I don't see it with this younger generation at all. I, they're, they, they may be politicized, but not on this issue. Sonia. No, no way. Especially the Western countries like Netherlands, Germany, I don't think they want to fight for uh, even for Europe itself to, uh, you know, <laughs> so this is this is something what will not happen. The elites are planning in the European Union, or they talk about it, a European army, but I don't think it will get off the ground somehow. It, it will not happen. And the demilitarization of, uh, I think it will happen for from NATO a large part, because as we speak about it all the time, Europe is losing badly in this conflict. It's the, it's the US. I will always call Europe a colony from the US, but let's hope that this will change somehow, because, you know, Europe is destroying itself. And uh, by all the weapons they have sent already the last 
one and a half year. It, it's crazy. So it, it, they run out of weapons. And also, you know, the Nord Stream pipeline is gone. So Germany is a big mess. Uh, the country where I'm born, the Netherlands, this is another point. They are the most uh, Russia-hating country, uh, the elites are, because we have Bellingcat there. Uh, we have the MH17 uh, disaster. Yep. So they still trying, you know, still trying and saying because Rota just uh, promised to deliver uh, F-16s. But the people, the majority of the people, they don't they don't believe in it anymore. If they even believe it, I don't think so. So I don't see it happening. And I see it happening that they somehow will demilitarize. That's most likely will happen in the near future. You know, and Brian, one of the, you know, you're, you're a former U.S. Marine. I don't know what a part of the U.S. Marines you were in, but I mean, over the last year and a half, I mean, the, during the first summer of the conflict, the Ukrainian army was decimated. And so after that, they started rebuilding a NATO uh, army with Ukrainian soldiers. But the NATO equipment uh, from all the various countries, they haven't equipped them, acquitted themselves very well. Uh, and particularly the American ones, very expensive, but particularly useless weapons here. And this is a great uh, embarrassment. Uh, that's why I don't think they want to send F-16s and stuff like that, because they'll drop out of the sky like flies. Uh, <laughs> so they've, they've really acquitted themselves very badly. Very expensive junk. Brian. Absolutely. There's there's so many factors that go into this. Uh, the fact that they sent uh, a whole variety of equipment to Ukraine. They didn't just send one type of infantry fighting vehicle or armored personnel carrier or tank or artillery. They sent everything everyone has ever developed since the end of World War II. They sent all of that to Ukraine. Each one of those pieces of equipment requires different types of training, maintenance, uh, are some in some cases different types of ammunition and fuel they have to coordinate all of this it, it makes already complicated logistics even more complicated the whole reason why militaries are standardized is to avoid this problem and then you have the problem with training i don't think people appreciate how much training goes into uh, creating even a basic infantryman or tanker or artilleryman they could take up up to half a year to do and they try to uh, not just transform conscripts, Ukrainian conscripts, into uh, uh, basic infantry or, or other basic roles. They try to create entire brigades with 4,000 men each and create it into a combined arms force. This is something that would take years. They tried to do this in two or three months. And the, the results are very predictable. Absolute catastrophe on the battlefield. And yes, a lot of destroyed NATO equipment. Okay, Alexander, I'll give you the last word. What's the next step, Alexander and Lisbon? The next step will be trying to uh, get more radical speeches in order to um, uh, bring down Russia, which will is highly unlikely to happen in this minute. I, I'm not going to say that it is impossible, but it is highly unlikely. But what I see is that they don't have a way back. They can't exit. They don't have a clean exit here in European Union and NATO. So they will try to continue support, providing support to Ukraine as long as their own economies and their defense systems allow. Otherwise, and then wait until there is some kind of point where they can reach out to Russia and finally celebrate any kind of peace deal. But presently- Well, I mean, but Al Alexander, what it'll be, I, I've already predicted it. They'll say, well, the, we, we stopped the Russians before they got it to Paris. We won, okay? <laughs> They'll have some kind of crackpot line like that. Anyway, folks, we've run out of time. I want to thank my guests in Bangkok, Lisbon, and here in Moscow.